Oh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to everyone with winter coats who's healthy today. Good to see you guys in the room. We're the survivors. All right. Before I jump into today's message, first of all, I just want to acknowledge uh, that not only was Christmas in Lake Country an incredible experience, but it was an incredible experience because of you guys. We had uh, record attendance at that service. We welcomed hundreds of people through our doors for the first time here in our new facility. And uh, the reason why we get excited about that is because we have good news of great joy to share with all people at Christmas. And so uh, we can't do that without you guys, because when you volunteer, you make it possible for us to welcome in all of our guests. When you invite someone, you bring them here to hear the message of good news that brings great joy. Uh, When you give, you're financially funding our mission as a church. So uh, we can't do that without you guys. So thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for partnering with each other to make a difference in people's lives and eternities at events like Christmas in Lake Country. If this is the year where you say, it's time for me to start contributing to this mission and making a difference, and you'd like to financially start supporting our church, uh, we would be so honored if you partnered with us. It's easy to give at Hope Church. You can grab your cell phone and text any dollar amount to 84321. You can go to our website, hopelakecountry.com slash give. If you brought an offering with you today, we have a box by every door. So on your way out, you can just put whatever offering you have uh, in that drop box on your way out. Now today, I'm excited because we're starting a brand new message series called Busy Body. Now, uh, quick uh, poll, just answer with a show of hand. Uh, How many of you have so much free time, that you're just wondering how to fill it. You're rarely stressed out or in a hurry or feel over busy. How many of us like, yeah, I'm never feeling hurried. I'm never... Okay. We'll see you guys in February because this is a series for people who are busy, who are often in a hurry, who feel the stress of our 24-7, 365 pace that we lead through life nowadays. Now, uh, since you're busy, people, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that today is going to be a very, very short sermon. In fact, today will be the shortest sermon I have ever preached at Hope Church. It will be. The bad news is that my introduction before the sermon starts today is very, very long. It is going to be the longest introduction I have ever given to a sermon. And the reason why I'm going to do this before we get to the sermon part of it, because you get to the end of it, you get home, you're like, that was a weird sermon. I just want you to know up front, it is. It's a weird sermon, okay? Um, Because I want to create space on the front of what we're doing today to evaluate. Because the problem with leading hurried lives, the problem with leading busy lives is that busy doesn't afford you the opportunity to evaluate your life. You're too busy to evaluate your life. You're too busy to evaluate what hurry is doing to your relationships. You're too busy to evaluate what hurry is doing to your soul. You're too busy to even ask the question, is this even the life that I wanted to live? So I'm going to create some space for you to do that this morning. And to get started with that, I'm actually going to give you a brief history lesson. Yes, history. I'm going to give you a history lesson. And uh, the reason why is because there's something that's interesting about our relationship with hurry. It's been driven in large part by new innovations in technology. And throughout history, innovation has outpaced evaluation and regulation, okay? Um, Here's what this means. Something new comes along. It changes the way we relate to work. It changes the way we relate to the planet. It changes the way we relate to one another. And because it's new, we've not evaluated it. It just does something cool. It's a nice hack. It makes something more expedient. It makes something more exciting. And so we embrace it. But while it's new, we haven't had time to fully evaluate it. What are the long-term effects of this innovation? Are there some unintended consequences that this innovation brings to us? And it's only after a period of evaluation can we wisely regulate a new innovation. Now, I don't mean government regulation, although sometimes that is the right and wise thing to do. I mean like the norms, the behavioral norms a culture builds around an innovation and what's acceptable and not, or or just your own norms about when an innovation comes along, are you going to adopt it or reject it or partially adopt it or what's good for your kids or your family or your season of life? That's just how life works. Innovation outpaces evaluation and regulation. Here's a couple of examples of this from history. In 1859, 
we learned how to extract cocaine from coca leaves. And it was amazing! (laughs) And people like Sigmund Freud got hooked on cocaine by the 1880s. And he touted it as a wonder drug. And very soon, cocaine was used as an ingredient in several medications. And it was put into consumer products, like Coca-Cola. But after enough time, there was a period of evaluation. Did this bring some unintended consequences? Turned out it did. And then regulation on cocaine, okay? Here's another example. Tobacco companies knew by the 1930s that their products were dangerous and hurtful. So what did they do? In the 40s and 50s, they paid millions of dollars to PR firms to convince doctors to smoke, and they paid millions of dollars to advertising firms to show the general public that if doctors smoke, how bad can it be for you? You should smoke too. And the innovation of PR, the innovation of propaganda, the innovation of mass advertising, it took a while for evaluation to catch up with the innovation so that regulation could take place. Well, we're going to see how innovation, when it comes to your schedule, when it comes to your pace of life, when it comes to your rhythm of life, has outpaced our evaluation and our regulation. I'm going to give you a very quick history of our relationship with hurry. I believe there's four primary innovations that have shaped our relationship with busyness. Now, there's probably more, and you have your own list. This is my sermon, so I'm going to give you my list of the four innovations that have shaped our relationship with being hurried. Number one is our ability to measure time. Mankind's earliest efforts to measure time go all the way back to ancient Egypt. Around the year 1500 BC, the Egyptian obelisk was built with the purpose of measuring time. But it wasn't an accurate measure of time. It basically told you when high noon was, okay? It's it's mid-morning, it's late afternoon, and what season of the year is it? But over time, uh, humanity continued to develop this technology until by the time of the Greeks and then by the time of the Romans, they dialed in the sundial. By 264, this technology was so advanced that a sundial could accurately tell you the hour of the day no matter the season of the year. Not bad. And that we also have our first recorded evaluation of what this technology did to society from this time. The Roman playwright Platus said this about our ability to measure the hours of the day. The gods confound the man who first found out how to distinguish hours. Confound him too, who in this place set up a sundial to cut and hack my days so wretchedly into small portions. At least sunny days. Cloudy days he still had to himself, but on sunny days, all of a sudden, there was a schedule and everything was regulated. So the next time you're feeling over busy or over scheduled, you can impress all your friends and quote a little platus. The gods confound the man who invented Google Calendar, right? So, so, so that was the first evaluation on what our ability to measure time is doing to our lives. Well, uh, as history unfolded from there, we became more advanced and experimented with different ways to measure time that didn't rely on sunny days. So we tried water clocks, candle clocks, incense clocks, but the first mechanical clocks were invented in Europe in the Middle Ages, and the first public clock tower with an hourly bell that chimed was built in 1336 AD in Milan, Italy. And you think that, a clock tower? Great Scott, where do they find enough electricity to power a clock tower? Well, it turns out it was a mechanical clock tower, and it was horribly inaccurate. It would be off by as much as two hours per day. Didn't measure minutes, just hours. But for the first time, a city had a synchronized schedule so they could get more done. They could be more productive. They could have more structured meeting time. And our ability to track time grew more and more advanced from there. Uh, By the 16th century, we could build clocks that measured not only minutes, but also seconds. And from that time forward, our ability to measure time grew smaller and more accurate. We had pocket watches, then wrist watches, then battery-powered watches. Now we have the atomic clock, which is incredibly precise. And then in the 80s, a revolutionary technology came along where it was called time and temp. You could get both in one package every time the power went off. Kids, it was so cool. You called a number with your phone, and it told you the time and the temperature. So, so Our ability to measure time got to the point where nobody asks what time it is anymore. When I was a kid, people would ask that question all the time. Hey, do you know what time it is? Nobody needs to ask that anymore because we have time measuring devices everywhere. We always know what time it is. 
Now, that allows us to be productive. It allows things like train schedules and air traffic controllers to do their job. We can synchronize travel. We can synchronize movement. We can get more done by measuring time, but it brings consequences with it. A historian, Daniel Burston, said this about our ability to measure time. Here was man's declaration of independence from the sun, new proof of his mastery over himself and his surroundings. Only later would it be revealed that he had accomplished this mastery by putting himself under the dominion of a machine with imperious demands, all its own. See, once we could measure time, we no longer just allowed our bodies to operate within the rhythm of creation. And the sun goes up and we wake up and the sun goes down and we go to bed. Now, we don't wake up and get out of bed when our bodies are rested. We get up to the drone of the alarm clock commanding our obedience, whether we're well rested or not. And we became more productive, but in exchange, we gave up just a little bit of our humanity. So that was the first innovation, and that was a pretty slow rolling innovation, our ability to measure time. The last three happened recently in the historical grand scheme of things. In fact, our relationship with hurry is a historical anomaly, and there's three innovations that made it true. The first was the invention of the light bulb in 1879. Did you know that before the light bulb, the average American slept 10 hours a night? Hmm, sounds good. Let's turn the lights out. Uh, Now we're down to seven hours or so a night, and um, we're tired. Uh, I I used to read about how saints from the past would wake up at like 4 a.m. for their time of morning prayer, and I would think, how do I get to that level of godliness? And then I realized they had nine hours of sleep in when they woke up at 4 a.m., to pray. And I thought, okay, how do I get to that level of godliness? Because with the light bulb coupled with our ability to measure time, we have completely divorced ourselves from the natural rhythms of creation. We no longer need the sun. We no longer need the rhythm of creation. We are under these machines now and operate our schedules accordingly. Again, we're more productive, but we've given away a piece of our natural humanity. Then in 1913, the next innovation came along that impacted our relationship with time. It was invented by good old Henry Ford with the assembly line. He looked at the way his Model Ts were manufactured, and he saw the workers doing an incredible amount of work, just going back and forth through the factory, gathering the parts, bringing them to the car, and then building it, where he realized, if I could bring the car to the workers, and every worker did the same job on the same part all day long, we could reduce costs and increase efficiency. So he built the assembly line, and sure enough, not only did he lower the cost of the Model T, he could produce eight times the number of vehicles per shift and the assembly line was born. Now, this revolution in technology flooded our lives with thousands of cheaply manufactured, widely available labor-saving devices, products marketed to you, the consumer, to save you time in your busy schedule, innovations like the furnace in your home. Before people had a furnace in their home, they had to go out cut down a tree or something, chop it up, bring it home, start a fire, and tend the fire. Now, think of how much time it saves by being able to push a button on your wall, or for many of us, push a button on your phone. It saves hours and hours of work. Or the microwave oven. Or your coffee maker. Or the car you have in your driveway. You used to have to take care of a horse. How much time did that take? Now, you just go to your car. Now you look for your car keys. That's the only thing slowing you down with transportation right now, finding your wallet and your car keys. So the question is, where did all our time go? These devices save us unbelievable numbers of hours every week and every month. This is the reason why in the 60s, futurists assumed that our biggest problem in our generation would be figuring out what to do with all of our leisure time, because in the 60s, they already had a good number of these labor-saving devices, but they saw the explosion of them that were on the horizon. And they save us so much time, so what happened to all of our time? Two things. Uh, The first is that our cultural values around status and importance changed. See, up until about 50 years ago, do you know how rich people flaunted their wealth and enjoyed their wealth? With leisure, 
activities. They played tennis. They went sailing. They sipped white wine at the golf club for lunch. They did things that were leisurely. And the reason why was because from the beginning of civilization up until the 20th century, normal people had to work from sun up to sun down to survive. The way rich people from the past showed their wealth and enjoyed their wealth was by not working. They had leisure time. But something's changed in the last 50 years. Now, the way we show status in the Western world is by working harder, by being busier, by having more going on, by being at more parties, more events, getting more done. That's why in the past, if you saw an ad for a luxury item like a Rolex watch, the ad featured a picture of a couple in South France by a pool, but now it shows a single person leading an important business meeting at a high-rise office in Los Angeles or New York or out late night at a trendy club. Now, in part four, I'm going to come back to this idea and explain why our cultural values shifted in this way from the, the wealthy being about leisure time to the wealthy being about busyness. But, but that is a shift that has happened. There's a second reason or that, that our free time, our extra time, has been consumed and we feel so busy, even though we have so many labor-saving devices, and it has to do with something that happened in the year 2007. Does anybody know what happened in 2007 that changed our relationship with busyness, time, and schedules forever. The iPhone was released into the wild. And not only did the iPhone hit your favorite Apple store in 2007, but it was also the first year that Facebook let the public sign up for an account. It was also the year that Twitter went public. It was also the year that Intel changed from silicon chips to metal chips so they could keep Moore's Law going and double the processor speed every 18 months. I believe that when the history books are written and they're going to identify the dawning of the digital age, 2007 will be the official birthday of the digital age because it changed everything in terms of how we live life and our relationship with time and schedules and productivity and busyness. Devices and inventions that were not around when we were born, like Wi-Fi and your phone. We can't even imagine existing on planet Earth for a day without Wi-Fi or your phone. These didn't exist when we were born. These didn't exist when my children were born. But already they've completely transformed the way that we approach life and live life. This innovation is so new, have we properly evaluated what it's doing to us, what it's doing to your relationships, what it's doing to your inner life, what it's doing to your soul? Quite frankly, the early evaluations are not positive at all. You probably know that Just having or just being in the same room as your smartphone reduces your working memory and your ability to solve complex problems. Did you know that? Your smartphone is making you dumber. You probably also know that in the last 20 years, the attention span of an American has dropped by 33%. At the same time, our anxiety levels have doubled. And that's not coincidence. Uh, Tristan Harris is a Silicon Valley insider. He used to work for social media. Now he runs a nonprofit organization. Its sole purpose is to develop a Hippocratic oath for software developers that they will do no harm by the software they create. He compared our phones, software, apps, devices to slot machines in Las Vegas. Slot machines make more money every year than the film industry and Major League Baseball combined but they only take a few coins at a time. So how do they make so much money? They're addictive qualities. It's just a few coins, just a few coins, just a few coins, but it adds up. He said, your device is the exact same way. They're created in a way to make you think, oh, I'll just scroll through social media quick. I'll just check my newsfeed quick, or I'll just check the forecast quick. But it's small deposits of attention given over and over and over again that create an addictive loop. 
In fact, uh, one study showed that the average American has no idea how much time they spend on their phones every day. It's this black hole of attention and time. Sean Parker was the first president of Facebook, and here's what he said about social media in specific. God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. The thought process that went into building these applications was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible? And that means that we need to give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post. And that's going to get you to contribute more content. It's a social validation feedback loop. Exactly the kind of thing that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. As a result of all of this innovation, capitalism itself is seeing a shift. You see, capitalism used to be about material goods and services. A manufacturer produces one of those labor-saving devices for as cheaply as possible and markets it to you, the consumer, and you, the consumer, decide that product will serve me. That will make my life better. So you purchase it, and now you own this product or you've been given this service that serves you. It makes your life better. But now we've entered a new phase of capitalism, digital capitalism. See, the phone in your pocket doesn't work for you, and you are no longer the consumer. You are now the product. Your phone doesn't work for you. It works for a billion-dollar corporation, and you are the product. It is trying to secure as much of your attention and time and conscious energy as possible. That's where the money is. That's how they make money, by securing your attention and your time. Psychologists, when they look at our relationship with the internet, with streaming services, with our phones, with software, they say, at the very least for most of us, it would be classified as compulsion. But for many of us, it's full-on addiction. Uh, here's what Tony Schwartz said about it in Addicted to Distraction. Addiction is the relentless pull to a substance or an activity that becomes so compulsive, it ultimately interferes with everyday life. By this definition, nearly everyone I know is addicted in some measure to the internet. Now, we're talking about those people out there, not us, right? So let's make this a little more personal for you. I have an assessment that we're going to take right now, and in this assessment, we are going to measure your relationship with hurry, with busyness, and with distraction. I'm going to give you nine categories, and just as we go through it, you keep count for yourself how many of these boxes you check in your life today. You ready for the assessment? Doesn't this sound fun? Here we go. Let's see how many apply to you. Here are the symptoms of hurry in our lives. Number one, irritability. The normal events of life irritate you. Not, not the extraordinary, not the ultimately unbelievably bad news. The normal events of life make you swear under your breath or maybe out loud because you're irritated just by normal day-to-day -day events, people, things like that. Number two, hypersensitivity. You struggle just rolling with punches, with minor setbacks. And depending on your personality, this might trigger anxiety. It might trigger exhaustion. It might trigger anger, but you're just, it's, again, it's not extraordinary life events. Normal things are triggering you in this way. Workaholism. Just push through. One more hour, one more day, one more month, We'll get there, we'll get to a new level of productivity, it's going to be awesome. And as a result, when you get to your loved ones, they get your leftovers. They get the exhausted you, the cranky you, the you that says, just give me a glass of wine. It's been a long day. 
Compassion fatigue. Empathy is not a common experience for you. You have such a hard time processing your own emotional pain that you have very little bandwidth to lean into someone else's emotional pain and feel with them what they feel. Restlessness. You try to rest, but you're too amped up on activity. You read your Bible, but you can't focus. It seems boring. You try to pray, but your mind wanders off. You sit down to watch television, and you notice five minutes in, you're scrolling through social media while you're watching television. You can't turn off the stimulus. Scattered priorities. You're busy, but you get to the end of the day, and you ask, what did I even get done today? You're busy, but what you're doing isn't aligned with what you say your actual values and priorities are in life. Neglect of your health. You're not getting eight hours of sleep or eating a balanced diet or spending time with a life-giving conversation with friends. You wake up tired. You live on the four food groups of sugar, carbs, caffeine, and alcohol. You're neglecting your health. Binge fill in the blanking. Pick your binge. You want to stream television? Stream television. You want to overeat? Overeat. Drink too much? Drink too much. Watch porn. Go shopping. The emotional pain inside is too great, so you completely distract yourself from it by your fill in the blank binging. Last one a lack of time with God. You're too exhausted to do the one thing that will actually bring life and healing to your soul. So, how many of those apply to you? If it's more than two, you are suffering from a hurried life. A busy life. And it's not just about what it's doing to your health. It's not just about what it's doing to your relationships or to your family or your emotional well being. For those of us who are Christians, for those of us who follow Jesus, do you know what Jesus said the greatest virtue is? It's love. Love God deeply. Love your neighbor. And love is not compatible with hurry. When I think of my greatest failures as a husband or dad, almost every time I was in a hurry because hurry is not compatible with love. That's why author and Christian pastor John Ortberg said this, hurry is not just a disordered schedule. Hurry is a disordered heart. You've got your love out of order. You've got your priorities out of order. Or one time there was a a Jewish rabbi who said it this way. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world? Yet forfeit their soul. But if we don't evaluate and regulate, that's exactly what our culture encourages us to do. Distract ourselves, take on more, be busier. So what's the solution to this? Let me tell you what I'm not going to argue for in this series. I am not going to argue for a return to some kind of mythical pre-digital utopia where everything was wonderful before technology ruined everything, okay? I grew up in the 80s. It's not as awesome as Stranger Things made it out to be, okay? And I don't want to live that way, okay? I I, I don't want to live a life without Google Maps and Spotify. I'll just put that out there, okay? This innovation is not all bad. There are many, if it didn't bring good things, we would not have embraced it so readily as a society. And, And the idea of living decades ago where I'm a farmer my whole life and then I get gout and die of dysentery doesn't sound awesome either. I I like where things are at, okay? I I don't want to go back to that. Here's what we're going to do in this series. 
we are going to learn how to live at a pace where our inner lives can flourish without compromising a fruitful life. And to do that, we are going to learn from the most productive man who ever lived, Jesus of Nazareth. See, here's the thing. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a Jesus follower, even if you don't follow Jesus, the reason why you should read his biographies if for no other reason is because he got more done in less time than literally anybody in history. He started a movement, a movement that not only is still around 2,000 years later, but 2.6 billion people alive today are part of that movement. And how long did it take him to launch this movement? Three years. That's a pretty good career right there. So even if you're not a Christian, Jesus is worth paying attention to because he got an incredible amount done with his life, and he was never in a hurry. He always walked wherever he went. He let nothing disrupt him. One time, uh, a message came to him, and the message was, Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick. He's about to die. Do you know what Jesus did? He stayed where he was for two more days. Another time, a man came and said, Jesus, my daughter is sick. She's about to die, this 12-year-old little girl. So Jesus says, I'll go help her. And he goes with the man back to his home. And in route, a woman intercepts him. And she's had this chronic health condition for the last... 12 years, and she interrupts him, and Jesus doesn't say, hey, listen, lady, I'll get to you in a minute. I've got to do triage on this dying girl. You just wait right here. No, he just stops everything, and he helps her out. He's not in a hurry. And for those of us who are Christians, listen, we don't just believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and he rose on the third day to make us God's children. We believe that Jesus lived a sinless life perfectly godly life. And if we as God's children are going to become more and more godly, we need to pay attention to how Jesus lived. Because he shows us a way to live that is both productive and rested. That is fruitful and unhurried. Now, with that as my introduction, I will begin my sermon. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, come to me, come to me, all you who are, what, weary and, what's the word, burdened. This is an invitation, Jesus says, for people, are, are, are you worn out, are you stressed out, are you fried, are you heading toward burnout, or are you in constant low-grade burnout, hey, if you're weary, if you're burdened, hey, listen, I want you to come to me. If you're weary, if you're burdened, come to me because I'm going to offer you something and I will give you, what's the word? Rest. Take a deep breath. Jesus said, I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Now I'm going to pause. A yoke was a harness that was put on an ox so we could pull a sled or a plow. And, and oftentimes, if it was a big job, they had a yoke that would harness two oxen together so the two oxen could pull a heavy load. Jesus says, I'm going to put a harness on you so you can pull a heavy load. We're like, what does this metaphor have to do with rest? doesn't make any sense to us. made perfect sense in that generation. Every rabbi in ancient times had a set of teachings, an approach to life, kind of rules of life. It was about how you do marriage, how you approach work, how you approach um, being a citizen in a nation, how you approach a family, how you approach everything. It was the rabbi's teaching. It was his life principles to live by. It was called his yoke. Jesus says, I have a yoke. I, ha I have an approach to life. I have a way to live life. And, and if you learn from me my way of life, if you take my yoke upon you and learn from me, you will have rest for your soul. And here's the reason why. In fact, if you have been scrolling on your phone because this is too slow, put your phone down and lean in. This is everything right here. For I, Jesus said, am gentle and humble in heart. I am gentle and humble 
in heart. If you read the four biographies of the life of Jesus, you will learn all about his miracles. You will learn all about his teaching. You will see how he died on a cross for our sins and rose on the third day. But here and here alone, Jesus discloses something about his heart. In ancient times, your heart was not just what you loved. It was the core and essence of who you are. It is your operating system. And Jesus says, let me tell you something about my operating system. At my core, I am gentle and I am humble. I am not going to look at you and your weariness and burden and cross my arms and say, you got yourself into this, you can get yourself out of it. He's going to, no, no, no. I wake up in the morning and I am gentle and I am humble. I go to bed at night and I am gentle and I am humble. That is Jesus' operating system. That's who he, has, who he is at his heart. I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find, this is interesting, rest for your souls. You might still have a busy schedule. Of course you will. You have to go to work. You have to raise kids. You have to do everything you need to do. But you can do that while having rest in your souls. Now, what we don't know, or many of us don't know, is that Jesus is not making this up. He's quoting something from the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah lived hundreds of years before Jesus, and he talked about this exact same principle. Jeremiah was speaking to people who had intentionally said, no, I'm good with God. We're going to do our own thing now. Here's what Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 6. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is. In other words, Jeremiah is saying, hey, you, you decided to do your own thing without God. How's that working out for you? How's your stress? How's your anxiety? How's your worry? Why, why, don't you, why don't you come to this crossroads and ask God for wisdom on what the wise way is to take from this point forward? Ask where the good way is and walk in it. Don't just know, take that path through life and what will happen? You will find rest for your souls. Jesus is inviting people the same way Jeremiah did. If you take his yoke, his teaching, his approach to life and walk that path with him, yoke to him, side by side with him, he promises you will find rest for your souls. And he continues, for my yoke is easy. Now, this word easy is better translated as kind. Um, the reason why it's translated easy is because it makes more sense to us with the metaphor. A yoke is heavy and it's burning, so we say it's easy. No, it, he's actually saying it, it's kind. He doesn't say life will be easy. Life will still be hard. Life will still bring tears. Life will still bring pain. But I have a yoke for you, a way through life that is kind. And my burden is light. So here's what we're going to do in the rest of this series. For the next three weeks, every week, we are going to look at one thing we learn from the example in life of Jesus, of what his yoke looks like, how to walk alongside the one who is gentle and humble in heart, how to live in the path of his kindness and gentleness and lightness. See, because what Jesus offers us is relief is rest for our souls. Imagine that you're, you're on a boat in the ocean and there's a man in the middle of the ocean and you're there to rescue him and you throw him the life preserver and you say, put this on. And he says, no, I'm already drowning. I can't take on the burden of a life preserver. Like, no, no, no. Th that's what gives you rest from your struggle so we can save you. Jesus comes to us in our weariness and our burden and he throws us his yoke and we're like, I don't have time to do these three practices we're going to learn in this series. Do you know how busy I am? It's like saying no to the life preserver. And I'm challenging you to come back for the next three weeks and learn these rhythms of Jesus. And I promise you, they will not erode your fruitfulness, but they will give you rest for your soul. Now, I'm going to tell you today what my application is. Um, this is going to impact you guys, actually. Um, we are in a cool season as a church, like a really exciting season. And, and when I just look out at, at the next five years, everything I see says this next five-year stretch is going to be the most fruitful 
season we've had as a church. I, I just see it all between being in this building and the staff we have assembled. It's going to be a really exciting five years, and I love everything about where this church is headed. There's one limiting factor that's going to hinder us over the next five years. This guy. See, I am in a place professionally in my life where I'm tired. And, and my tank is empty. Now, the good news is I know why it's empty, and more importantly, I know how to refill it. That's the good news. It's empty for two reasons. Number one is that it's been a crazy five years professionally for me. Um, if you've been around, you know the story. If you're newer here, you're like, what's happened over the last five years? A couple things. Um, we became an independent church. We went from being grossly understaffed to finally being fully staffed. I love our team. Um, we, were, we had to go through that. Um, that one time we had a global pandemic. We went through that. Um, we did a capital campaign to get into this building. We designed a building. We built a building. We moved into a building. And then we had to redesign all of our systems because we outgrew all of them with our grand opening. And it's just been this five years of next thing, next thing, next thing. It's been third and short, and I'm a fullback and keep the legs turning with no rest in between. And I'm, my tank's empty, quite frankly. Well, it's part of the reason why it's empty. The bigger reason is because when I'm busy like that, I go into workaholism mode. And I say, push to the next thing. Just get it done. And when I lean into my effort, rather than trust that Jesus has the way to rest for my soul and walking with him in his approach to work, my tank gets drained. Now, to be clear, everything in my life is genuinely great right now. My family is great. I love my wife. I love my boys. I love living in Lake Country. Everything about my life is great. Everything about this church is legitimately great right now. The only thing wrong is my tank is empty. So here's my application to Jesus' invitation. This summer, I'm going to take a sabbatical. Um, a sabbatical is when you take time off your uh, normal day-to-day -day job to focus on a project that you normally can't get to with your day-to-day -day job. Well, for me, I'm going to take time off my day-to-day -day job to focus on the project of refilling my tank, emotionally, spiritually, physically, everything, so that at the end of summer, I'm not the limiting factor in what God wants to do in this church, and we can move forward with the jets firing into a season that, again, I believe is going to be fantastic. And I'm working with my counselor and putting together a plan to make sure it's a very fruitful and productive time. But the truth is, uh, when I've been yoked to work instead of Jesus rhythm, it's led to an empty tank. But that's what happens for all of us. You see, weariness in life comes from being yoked to anything other than Jesus. Whatever it is, when we walk in the way of anything other than Jesus, it will lead to weariness. So, over the next three weeks, I'm challenging you to come and learn one thing from the way of Jesus and put it into practice in your life. And don't worry about summer. We've been planning this for a while already. Nothing's going to miss a beat around here. And we have an incredible team, and you'll be fine. <laughs> we'll all be fine. Um, now, I'm not going to ask you what you're going to do with today's message yet because it's really come back for the next three weeks. Uh, but on your way out, uh, we're going to give you this card. It looks like a coaster for your beer. It's not. Um, actually, it might be a good reminder. Use this as your coaster for whatever beverage you're enjoying. And it's got this invitation from Jesus that we learned about today on it. Now, uh, whatever you do, put it somewhere where you're going to see it. And whenever you see it, I want you to take 20 seconds and really think about the invitation that Jesus is offering you when he says, come to me. And, and don't lose it. Hang on to it, because I'm going to give you an assignment next week for this very card that you're getting today. But uh, to, to wrap up my time, and then we're going to sing one more song, here's what I'm going to ask you to do in just a second. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, and I'm going to ask you to listen for the voice 
of Jesus. Now, when the preacher asks me to close my eyes, I'm the guy who says, I'm not closing my eyes. I don't, you know, I'm going to keep an eye on you, preacher. That's fine. I'm not, I'm not going to judge you if you don't close your eyes. But listen, as soon as you walk out the doors, you know what you're walking back into? A hurried life. So you made the investment to be here today. So take this as a gift from Jesus in just this quiet moment to hear his words and invitation. So let's close our eyes, take a deep breath, and listen for his voice. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Come to me, all. Come to me. 